Well, good morning, everyone. Billy Arnold here. It is my absolute privilege to be able to come and share again a message um, out of the uh, out of the Bible, uh, scripture message. It's not my message; it's God's message, and I happen to be privileged to be the deliverer of that. Uh, Romans eight. We're going to deal with here in just a minute. But uh, one again, uh, thank you all for joining us. As we've all said multiple places, uh, I could tell as soon as I pulled up this morning. It was going to be a great Sunday and a lot of people be here. There are three cars in the parking lot and we are totally packed out. Uh, uh, Brad Tucker over here, uh, his car, Rachel and Kevin Perry, their car, my car. Uh, we had to jockey for the right car uh, slot, the place to park our cars. Uh, it certainly is a bit of an unusual season in, it, in that sense. But actually, I do know it is a full room and uh, we're glad to be able to. And I hope you feel the warmth of, of the personal part of that. And I would add into that Heather's car. But Heather did her part from her backyard. So from her, Heather's backyard or us here uh, in this building this morning, uh, we bring you greetings as well. Um, I want to just kind of start with a story a little bit. Penny and I, my wife and I, um, many, many years ago when we were a young couple, uh, I had not been on too many airplanes. Uh, I had not uh, traveled very much, but we got invited uh, to go visit a friend and be a part of a uh, youth ministry event, actually. And we were flying to a different state. <clears throat> and I didn't have a lot of experience at packing. And this is a long time ago before all the even rules at that time about uh, entrance into airports and such. But we packed for a five-day trip. We must have packed enough to stay for, you know, four months. Uh, I think it was just the, the uh, lack of experience. And we happened to be in the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. And I didn't really quite know how to get to the ticket counter, where are you supposed to check your luggage in? And they did have different rules in those days anyway. And I remember uh, being confused. And DFW is a sprawling airport anyway. And, and uh, when I was going to this counter, where's the counter? Where do I check my bag? And we had this monster, monstrous amount of luggage with us. And uh, uh, I remember it was hot and I was sweating and we were running around and we almost missed the plane because of all this stupid luggage that we had with us, all this overabundance of stuff that we've been out there uh, that was a part of our experience on that trip. The vast majority of it, of course, we didn't really need at all. You and I have a problem with too much stuff. Uh, we carry around too much baggage, too much garbage, too much stuff in our garage, too much, too big, big of an amount of, too large of an amount of stuff in our wardrobe in that way. Uh, too many pills in our medicine cabinet, I'm pretty convinced most of the time. Um, and we're always seeking a way to kind of get through all of that. And maybe that stuff will help us survive into whatever new world that we happen to be entering into at that point. The, the truth is, uh, we need a resurrection, right? But when we're trying to sort through all of that stuff out there, I've, I've thought about this. There's kind of essentially two solutions to that. One solution is, is the human side of a solution. So we could always trust in that great Bible verse that says, God helps those who help themselves. Except, that's actually not a Bible verse. It's often, often quoted as a Bible verse, and it certainly is a normal thought that what we really think is, I've got to solve this problem. I've got to fix it. Uh, ultimately, that that theme that comes along is really a sense of humanism. Or maybe it's the power of positive thinking. If I just think positively enough, I can overcome all of the junk and the, the, the issues of my life. And uh, I've kind of thought of that as a little bit like rearranging the, the chairs on the sinking Titanic. Patty and I just the other night in the middle of all of this lock-in thing, we, we actually watched another slice of the Titanic movie again and watched them sort of prepare themselves for the sinking of a ship and the unaware of that. We often live our life that way, um, or even like one of my favorite little kind of a TV shows. I really do like it. It's, called, it's a PBS uh, series called This Old House, where you take an old shack and you turn it back into a house again. It's a cool way to renovate a home, but we're trying to renovate our house that way, and that becomes kind of the human solution. Uh, God's solution, though, was it what we brought out last week on Easter Sunday morning. God's solution is truly a resurrected life, a new life. Christ rose from the grave, literally from death and decay. It's not just the power of positive thinking. It's literally a new creation, a new life. God Himself brought that to us. Again, that's the Easter story. The, the book of 2 Corinthians says that the old tent is gone. 
You know, we're living in this temporary tent. We have a new world to look forward to in 2 Corinthians 5. Romans 8 is the passage that I want to, that we're going to dwell on for the next few weeks, actually. This, this one chapter, we kind of launched into it last week at the end of Easter, but I want you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. I don't care what version you have in that. And, and step by step, today, last week a little bit, today, and actually for the next couple of weeks, we're going to stay right here in this chapter. It is literally rich with what I think are incredible instructions of a series of messages that, that you know, I've kind of titled it Epic because it's God's great epic story. You know, the, the epic meaning that transformational time that, that changed the course of life. Lewis and Clark had an epic journey across the West and that changed the course of the world, if, if certainly America. And we could go on and David Livingston in Africa, and we used those illustrations last week. But what does Romans 8 say as a result of the resurrection that becomes a part of God's epic story? And it has to do some, very much with this idea of the weight that we were carrying, this extra baggage that we tend to in this broken world, in this broken state that I live in, right? Uh, it, it, it gives great illustrations. It gives a great theological understanding of all of what this epic new life can mean for us. Number one, the, the last point of last Sunday's sermon I'm going to reiterate it one more time in a short way, is in this great epic story is that God offers us an epic pardon. An epic pardon. It, it's, uh, it's literally that, that uh, judicial kind of a term that says, you and I are guilty. You and I, through Christ, become pardoned. Um, uh, that verse 1 of Romans 8, look at it for a second. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Circle that word, no, that phrase, no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. Just stop there for a second. Literally, like that illustration that I used of the, the baggage that's carried through an airport because you feel like you have to have this stuff to go somewhere. Like all of us feel like we, have to, we can't go anywhere in life until we have all of this stuff kind of with us. That, that's that personal stuff. There, there's, there's several things that we carry with us in our life that are extra baggage. They have nothing to do with a suitcase, but undeniably it's heavier than a suitcase. And one of them is personal guilt. We all tend to walk around dragging through life this guilt kind of stuff that comes around in us. I've often used it, think about it in the illustration like this. We all know what an earthquake and we know what fault lines are, right? A fault line is that is that, um, that mark in the earth that is there, uh, you know, in the, in, in the geology of it all, where one portion of the earth shifts and turns and grinds on the other, and it, it begins to turn. And when it jumps, obviously, I'm no scientist, but that's an earthquake. My wife and I in college still to this day laugh about um, a video that we watched years ago that was about San Francisco, the city that waits to die. And we'll never forget that. I've shown in our geology class in, in, when, I, when we were both in Baylor. And uh, I, I think about that now because Alvin and Jenny Lynn, being from the Bay Area there, Alvin uh, was associate pastor in our church. And, and you know, we, we often think of that city. Well, here in Seattle, of course, we have those issues too. A lot of other places in the world have those issues. But the, the point is we understand the fault line. But isn't it interesting that it, we call that a fault line? Now, I don't know all the terminology of why we arrived at that term, but I find it fascinating that that is just highly illustrate, has it, is illustrate, illustrative, whatever that term is, of, of us as human beings and the stuff that we carry around. We carry around fault. We carry around guilt. And marred into every one of our lives is this guilt line, this mark that goes across our heart. And we're constantly teetering on that edge of life, right? Um, we're constantly worried that we know there are cracks in our heart. We know there are fault lines in our life. There are things that, we, that are our fault. And most of the time, they're fairly secure until one day an earthquake takes place, an economic earthquake like what's going on right now. Uh, a global shutdown, 
a business shutdown, you've been laid off from your job, a marriage that, a relationship that starts to, 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 to go awry, awry, and that fault line that is not our marriage partner's fault, or not even our boss's fault, or our government's fault, or even a virus's fault. That fault line begins to show because life begins to move because it's our fault. And crack it goes, an earthquake takes place. You can walk in life and live a life in a new way. The epic story of Christ is He brings an epic pardon for us so that the fault lines that are already in existence in your life can no longer kill you. They're no longer going to be viable. Again, look at Romans 8, 1 again. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of God, or the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. You're free from that guilt, that fault line. Go on and it says, for what the law was powerless to do because it weakened, it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. We talked about that last week. And I want to remind you again that the epic story of God can bring an incredible cure to the fault lines of your life. You no longer have to carry around the burden of the guilt that you've been carrying around. Romans 3, 6.23 puts it this way. The wages of sin, the wages of that fault line is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Write that verse down. Highlight that in your Bible. Romans 3, uh, uh, 5 verse 8, one of my favorites says, But God demonstrates His love toward us in that while we were still in the fault, while we were still sinners, while we were still in that fearful stage of life of that waiting for that coming city person that waits to die, that earthquake that's going to shatter us. Christ freed us from it. Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. You no longer have to hide. You no longer have to live by the model of, you know, motto of God, you know, I know I've got problems, but God helps those who help themselves. The quite truth is you can't do that because you're going to be constantly hiding. You're going to be constantly sneaking around. You're going to be constantly filling your life with stuff and garbage and stuff that's going to accumulate. Now, we all fill our lives with stuff, right? We understand that, but, but that becomes a burden for us. Christ's epic story brings an epic pardon, which is a brand new life and an epic freedom that is of, to live a life that you were originally created to live. That was really the first point of this epic story of Romans 8. And I'm going to give you point two. And I'm going to give you two major points this morning. We're going to pick this up again next week. But the second point of all this is not only did he really invite us in and, we, and offers us an epic pardon, but he invites us now into his epic family. Just to use that phraseology so you understand how this passage works. It's not so important that you remember my terminology. It's most important that you remember or my sermon, you remember Romans 8, which is why we're parking on this for four weeks, is that this, you, get in, you and I get invited into an epic family, event, uh, uh, to be a part of an epi epic lineage, a change in a whole way. Now, let's just stop for a second. I'm going to take a little time here with a kind of a long illustration, uh, but I want you to capture it because I think it'll mean something to you. We get burdened sometimes, I think, by our ancestry. Some of us are proud of it. Some of us are not. Some of us are kind of in the between on that. But uh, there's kind of that understanding of, you never think about being embarrassed of your ancestry. Those of you who've been sitting around watching a lot of movies lately and, and you know, been in the homebound thing and either you're watching 2012 football games and baseball games or you're maybe watching Netflix series and one of them is called The Windsors and it goes through and it does this whole long uh, uh, storyline of, of those that were in the lineage of the uh, English, the British monarchy. It's a fascinating story. I love the story. I've been through, Patty and I have been through some castles before and you go to these castles and you have, you know, paintings on the wall of this is my, this is the great, great, great grandmother and this is the great, 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 great grandfather and this is the, you know, uncle on the third, you know, step side and my cousin and da, 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 and it lays them all out. This one was good. This one was partially good. This one was bad. This one was good and bad. This one was, you know, whatever it was. And we, 
put these paintings on the wall. We all kind of do that, and we all have a lineage in that way. And the, and the, the issue is some of that, and the reason that storyline, and bear with me on the long illustration, but is because we are fascinated by heritage because, first off, we want to know where we come from. But secondly, we're also curious, why am I the way I am? You know, what dictates me and my behavior and my circumstances? Is it because of my heritage? Well, humanly speaking, partially. I'm an introvert and I'm an extrovert. Uh, my daughter, our youngest child, uh, you know, we, she always says this, uh, our daughter Diane, she's, she's, she, uh, my wife and I are very much extroverts. Our son is very much an extrovert and my daughter always thought she was an introvert until she left home and she realized she was an extrovert. She just wasn't as much of an extrovert. The three of us sort of buried her for a while. That's kind of the family joke in that way. But whatever you are is kind of dictated it's partially by your heritage or your tendencies, your inclinations, your dispositions. Um, Romans 8 actually deals with the weight that we carry around with our ancestry. Let me read part of the story and follow along with this. Now let's pick this up uh, starting in verse 5. I'm going to read a, a good bit of this with me. So read along with me in verse 5, Romans 8, verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Move on, verse 6. The mind governed by the Spirit is death, but the mind uh, governed by the Spirit, uh, 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 excuse me, that, but I lost my place. The mind, is, is, where am I? Verse 6. Let me read verse 6 again. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Uh, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh, look at this, underline this, cannot please God. You're in the wrong. You're living in the fault zone. Go verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit. That is, you who have come into faith. You've adopted a new life in that way. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, that's really important. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. That's a, all of these are super important lines, right? But if Christ is in you, it goes on, then even your body is subject to death because of sin. Uh, uh, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. I challenge you to do this in your own study. Listen, guys, one of the best things about online services these days that, that, uh, that we've kind of created here, this this late in the week getting ready for the Sunday service and the, the following the Sunday services to go back and study it. And pretty soon we're going to challenge even you more and more with questions. But I challenge you to take Romans 8 this week. Take that passage and underline and circle all the places where it says flesh and all the places where it says spirit. And think about the differences between those two because this passage really talks about the family and the epic family, but it uses an interesting comparison as it walks into that. There's two comparisons. One is the comparison of the flesh versus a life in the spirit. A life in the flesh and a life in the spirit. So I ask you again, what are your tendencies? What are my tendencies? What are your tendencies in your family heritage? You're the core of your personality. Where did it all come from? Your family traits. And I'll give you a few more illustrations. Patty and I have, uh, as you guys know in our church family, uh, have over many years, we occasionally use this as an illustration because it's such a good one, but over a 13-year period of time, we had 53 different people who lived in our home. 53 different human beings who lived there. Shortest to live there was three months. The longest to live there was six, seven years, actually. Uh, the vast majority of these young people, all of them being young, the vast majority of the pe these people were college students. And all of these college students, I think uh, all of them, actually were international students from 16 different countries who lived in our home. I mean, we had them from everywhere. And uh, we, they, not 
53 at one time, obviously, but many, most of the time it was overlapping human beings. Some of you immediately have never heard this before. I'd say your guys are crazy, but we worked as a host family for the local Green River Community College. And in doing that, we had, you know, East Asians, South Asians, you know, we had uh, Europeans, Eastern Europeans, Western Europeans, North Africans, East Africans, you know, it's set it on and on and on it goes in that way. And we've had a lot of traits that come in. So we had a lots and lots and lots of conversations about the differences of people, the heritage of people's lives over and over again. They came from all kinds of religious backgrounds. They were Buddhist. They were Muslim. They were atheists. They were Scientologists. They were, uh, you know, Christians of different varieties of forms or nothings. And all of these kinds of traits that come along, we had them all. And uh, it was kind of fun, and it's a pretty unique part of our story. But the, the fun part of that story is that there, is, uh, there are traits that come about that, that change the way the tendencies of people's lives. I, uh, and one of them is cultural heritage. We understand that. So if you're from somewhere, you know, born or raised from a part of the United States, uh, like I was and like you were, or maybe you were born in a different country, or, you know, or, or some of the students that we had, those traits came to you, and some of the things that you did kind of related to the way you acted and behaved. And some of you spend your life going, well, I'm this way because I am of this descent. I'm of this heritage, this race. One of our dear friends who lived with us, he and his sister both lived with us, Andrew and, and Rosalind Bala. Andrew, uh, like a few of our church members, like Paul and Divya Talari, He's from South India, and we used to have so much fun. He said, well, that's the way I am because I'm South Indian. And, Paul, and Andrew's comment always was, well, we are the Indians that Columbus actually thought he found, and, uh, and which is why the term Indian came to North America. But the point of all of that is we had so lots of fun discovering those cultural heritages. That's the way we are, and we often think of people that way. Second one is an environmental heritage, sort of a, the way you were raised in that way. I have a, a, a test that I gave in August to Michelle, if you're with us this morning, obviously I just recently, they're about to get married and I gave them this prepare and rich test. And we had this bullseye thing that says, this is my family background. In my family, we were either rigid about the way we made decisions or chaotic. We were really extremely close to each other or we were distantly far. And there's that, that circle, kind of a bullseye. Where were you raised in that? And there's a tendency that the way you were raised is the way you're going to behave in the future. It's a great little fun test in that way. Um, and we often think, well, you know, because my family was chaotic, that's the way my life is now. Or we were rigid and all of the spoons and forks had to be placed exactly the same way and the, and the stapler had to be put on the table the exactly same way every time uh, in that way. And you know, it's environmental. Nothing wrong with it. It's kind of the way it is. So we're either cultural, environmental, uh, in that way, and uh, uh, it, it, and so, in fact, even just as a funny little illustration, another little simple movie I watched the other night was the movie Hitch. I like that movie where uh, Will Smith plays the character. He's trying to find this girlfriend and impress her, and she's a descendant of somebody who came to Ellis Island, and they went and he found the name of this person. Uh, we're great, great grandfather. And if you know that scene, she runs in there. And at first he thought I'm impressing her. She breaks down in tears. Why? Because he was called the butcher. And Will Smith's famous line was, I thought it was an occupation. I didn't realize it was a headline. Well, he was a murderer. And they were embarrassed about his heritage. Some of you may be carrying that around. Or maybe it's just a personality that you were born with. You're an optimist. You're a pessimist. You're a contentious you're agreeable. I met a lady just the other day who does testing for businesses and personality tests for people. But in the middle of all that, she says, well, I, get, I could guess your personality in, in five minutes of conversation with you. You're either a golden retriever or you're a bulldog or you're a whatever you are uh, that's out there. The world is out there constantly dividing us and we carry around my whole long illustrated point you and I carry around with us a baggage in our life that is based upon our environmental heritage, our cultural heritage, or our personality that we have to be born with. And we think that we have to live and die on that point. And we're constantly trying to fix it, constantly trying to make it better, be better educated, get our finances and our job back together. The bottom line is we're pretty screwed up, all of us. Not a one of us escapes that. 
That's really the whole passage of Romans 8, which I'm going to read a little bit more in a minute because it compares the life of the flesh, is the wisdom of mankind. The life of the flesh says, I'm going to figure this out for myself compared to the life in the spirit, which is really saying, I'm inviting in the vastness of the wisdom of the almighty God of the creator of the universe to bring in a new life. That's what Romans 8 says. And we get revived and restored. The revival that takes in in our life is not just a series of services or something. It's literally a complete and total restoration. Much of the time as a pastor, I'm not a professional counselor. We have professional counselors in our church and I love them. I applaud them. They do wonderful things. But I want you to know that most of the time, the counseling, the pastoral counseling that I've done for people's lives is that I'm, I, I'm literally having to go back and unwind all of those traits of the luggage and the baggage and the garbage that is brought in when people say, I not only have a, carrying around a lot of guilt, but I'm also carrying around all of this heritage that I'm ashamed of. Romans 8 unwinds that for us. In Romans 8, 12, just a few more verses, it says, that, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh. Again, I want you to just literally pour yourself over this passage over the next few days because it speaks to this. We don't have a prior obligation, to, to but it is not. We, this obligation we have is not to the flesh and to live according to it. In fact, right now, just highlight all the words where it says spirit in your own Bible. It says, for if you live according to the flesh, this is verse 13, you will die. But if you live in the spirit, you will, be, you will put to death the misdeeds of the body and you will live. Verse 14, for those who are led by the spirit of God are now what? Children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you a slave so that you live in fear again. You're not carrying around this baggage. Rather, we, uh, uh, the spirit you received brought about your, and circle this, adoption to sonship. And that's not just a male thing. In fact, the Bible is very clear. We're talking about humanity here. By him, we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share His sufferings, in order that we might also share His glory. I hope indeed I have helped set your mind again on, on what Romans 8 is really saying through this two parts. And again, more to come soon. But literally that illustration of going through the airport carrying all this baggage of stuff in life that you don't need. First, again, it's that whole fault line, this guilt that you carry around. And it's real. I'm not just saying it's not real. It's real. But we find pardon from it. But secondly, this heritage, this flesh life. I want you to ask you to understand this, these last couple of simple points. First is the word there that I want to park on for a moment is adopted. We get adopted. Verse 15 says in this beautiful thing, when you live not in the flesh, not under human wisdom, but you decide, I am literally going to now live in the Spirit of God. I'm going to let Him be the wise one for me. And I'm going to let go of some of the, the fear baggage that I'm carrying around in my life and this junk, whether I, I'm proud of my heritage or I'm not proud of it or somewhere in between, which is where most of us are. But I'm going to get adopted into a new family, no matter who we are. No matter where you're from, no matter what cultural background, what language, who your parents were or anything else, I get adopted and I'm brought into a brand new family. That term adopted is very much that Roman terminology when, when this letter was written to the church at Rome, this most, powerful nation, this most powerful city in the world and nation of the world at that time. And this is a Jewish man writing to these citizens there and saying, you get an adopted into a brand new family in a brand new way. Uh, uh, that's why Ephesians 1.5 says, you know, we are, we are adopted into a sonship through Christ Jesus. We now get, become citizens of a new kingdom, a citizen of the kingdom of God, a child of God, because Christ prayed, paid the price and we accept Him. 
and we get totally adopted in. It is very much that human scale understanding of being brought into a new family. I may not have been birthed in. Humanly, we get it. We have many of us in our church, several of us, who have, were physically adopted, birthed family here, adopted into a new family. Whether we're proud of this, old fam- this new family or not proud or somewhere in between. At some point, the, the same illustration is you and I, all of us, no matter who our heritage is, get adopted in. And we only get brought in by being reborn and adopted into this family. This is very important. Most of us, uh, many of us, have sort of a personal pride in our life because we say, well, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I, we're all kind of children of God. Let me be very clear, very clear about this. Yes, we are all All of us, the creation of God. All of humanity is a creation of God. But let me, theologically, let me point this out. We're not all children of God. You don't get born into this being a child of God. Uh, If that were true, Paul would say, it would be me. Paul said, I was born a Jew. I was born a Pharisee. I was in the best schools and the best heritage. And everything that I heritage brought into it all Paul would say, became nothing. If that were true, Billy Arnold, quite frankly, I have lots of flaws in my family and lots of flaws in my life, for sure. But to be honest with you, I was born in a pretty good heritage. And if anybody could be proud of a heritage, I'm the son of a Baptist pastor. And so by being that, we could say, oh, well, look, all the good benefits that you come in your life. You Look, you, you know, all the good things that take place, and they were good. But if that's what it took, then... You know, then first off, uh, it, it's a total failure for me, and it's a complete failure for the vast majority of the world. That's why Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, how do I find this? He said, you must be born again. Nicodemus, you great Jewish man who is a scholar, you had all the right credentials. That's why many of us come along and we say, well, what's your faith? And we say, well, I was born a Catholic, and, or I was born a Baptist, or I was born a Lutheran, or I was born a Buddhist, or I was born a you know, Muslim, or I was born a whatever, whatever, whatever. At the end of the day, God says, I don't care. That's not your whole point. You're missing the whole point of heritage here. It's about whether or not you've been born and adopted into God's family. When you come to faith in Christ, you are reborn. You are brought in to become a child of God. The creation of God becomes a child of God when you are adopted in and regenerated and restored. That's adopted. And that has to be true for every one of us. And it can be for you. And the end result is we become this beautiful term. He says in Romans 8, we become heirs. We become literally heirs to being a child of the king. Inheritors of all that God has created us for us to have. Life becomes real. All of a sudden, that baggage that we've been running around in our life and constantly trying to fix everything, trying to to make everything right, no longer becomes the value that it was um, because we are pardoned from the fault and we are adopted into a new family so that we are no longer slaves. Galatians 4, I'm going to write that down. Galatians 4, 1 through 7, those verses talk about you are no longer slaves. You are a child of of God, and then the, the and you are His heir. You literally can inherit. Inherit. We all love that term humanly. If we have something to inherit, but some of us are in sh- ashamed of our human inheritances. Some of us financially go, "Well, I can't wait until it comes." Well, I want you to know that is nothing like the inheritance that God gives us when we become a child of God. Romans eight is passages of security. I give you all these passages because in this, this chapter for this month because I want you to know we're all running constantly our lives and making some stupid decisions in our life, be they relational decisions, be they job decisions, be they makeover decisions, because quite honestly, we're all running in fear, which is what I'm going to talk about next week uh, in the next part of, of Romans 8. But in this beautiful passage, we are a part of of God's family when you come into faith with Him. And this last thought that I'm going to give you before Rachel sings is this. We then, this verse tells us, once we are adopted into this family, 
and we come into that relationship. It says this beautiful thing in verse 16, it says, or verse 15, it says, when you receive this adoption of sonship and by him we cry out, Abba, Father. That term literally means dad. It's a familiar term. It's that family-related relational term that says, I'm close to him. He is mine. I can go to him. No matter where I came from, no matter what has happened, I get adopted into God's family. I want to uh, I want you to hear this song that Rachel is about to sing. I'm going to pray for just a moment. And I want you to just listen to this song and sing along if you want to. But about how you can become a child of God and how this He knows who you are and you get to be included in His family. Let's pray together for just a moment. Almighty God, thank you for allowing us to become, uh, to living a life that we don't have to carry around this extra stuff anymore. We ask for your truth to stick with us uh, in this way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Last couple thoughts I want to give you before we wrap this up for today is, number one, we're going to continue the study in Romans 8. I'm going to come to one of my, uh, the latter part, it just gets better and better from verse 18 on. I'm going to deal with it next week and the following week. Uh, and I want you to read it for yourself as you prepare your hearts even for next week. And, Listen online, which um, Kevin and I are going to do a little conversation, and it'll probably come out on Tuesday that might help prepare you for that. But use, my stress to you is use Romans 8. It's, it's one of the great life passages that help unwind the scars of your life. That, that sort of unwind and, and begin to mend all the junk that we happen to be carrying around. This is, this is an important passage for your life, not just for a, a season of coronavirus and, and fear and loss of jobs. Of course, it even ramps up its meaning in this passage. But use this passage to help you understand that, that I can have a new life at any juncture of time. I don't have to hide anymore. I don't have to be afraid of the fault line cracking and, and the earth, or the earthquake cracking and the fault of my own life all of a sudden being jarred in a way that I thought might take place, but becomes a reality. I don't want to be afraid of my heritage because I get adopted, no matter who you are, into a new family when you come into faith with Him. Here in just a moment, Kevin's going to wrap this up, and there's a couple of buttons that he's going to talk about, about what it means to have somebody pray for you, somebody pray with you. Uh, and he's going to highlight those. But, but it, when you do that, it might be that you could say, I need somebody to pray with me about something, uh, even my relationship to Christ, or a fear that I'm having, or I might need some real help along the way. Uh, this is what we do as a church. We're here to, to help bring God's word and God's truth to mend your lives. But especially, well, this is true for anyone, but as somebody whose son was all along the way say, I've never known that. I've relied upon my own human heritage to make this way in my life. That's not gonna ever be good enough. You cannot be good enough, cannot come from a good enough family. Uh, I wanna become a child of God. And my prayer is that you become a child of God you do that literally by submitting to Christ and opening up your heart in a whole new way. And I'll have to spend the rest of my life trying to you know, pile up stuff and try to fix this and fix that and fix my marriage and fix my money and fix my job and fix my relationships because I can literally lean upon the wisdom and the life of the Creator God of the universe that He has now given to us because of what Christ has done. I'm gonna pray one more time and this is the best part as we uh, uh, open up our hearts and our lives to Him. And we're going to pray for now and prepare ourselves for the next time we study. And then Rachel's going to sing one more song for us. Pray with me one more time. Right now, wherever you're sitting, you might want to just open up your heart and say, Dear God, I want to trust you with my heart. I want to trust you with my life. I am sick to death of, of leaning upon all the the emotional, spiritual, sometimes even physical baggage that I've brought around in my life. I'm sick to death of that, God. My prayer, God, is for that, that the truths of Romans 8 literally seeps out across into everybody's house. And all this Bible that everyone in, in, in our church family, everyone who's here a part of this service today has access to physically in a paper Bible or in, a, or in an electronic Bible. We all have access to this truth. May your truth seep into our souls. 
so that we let go of the old and become a part of your family again. I pray that each one of us will open up our hearts and submit to you, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We pray this in the name of the Savior, Jesus Christ.